The M1 MacBook Air is already a really powerful laptop. I've pushed it to its limits, I've modded it, air cooled it, and now to squeeze every bit of performance I possibly can out of the M1 chip, I'm going to water cool it. And in this video, we're going to see if water cooling is even possible, and if it is, can we unlock the true potential of the M1 MacBook Air with a CPU cooler meant for some of the biggest and most powerful CPUs ever made? And you know what? The results were pretty surprising. So let's jump straight into it. Quick thanks to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video, but more on that later. Okay, so this is a base model M1 MacBook Air. No upgrades, just eight gigabytes of RAM and also the seven core GPU. And this is a 280 millimeter AIO cooler. Now AIO stands for all in one. It means that the water is actually self-contained within this unit. So you don't need to do custom piping. You don't need to fill the radiator up yourself. It's all just ready to go. You essentially just plug and play. So first things first, let's get this out of the packaging and see if we can set this up. Now, just while we're taking this out of the packaging, you guys might have seen a couple of videos on this channel where I've actually modded this particular M1 MacBook Air. So there was one where I actually added some thermal pads onto the back. And the purpose of that is to actually draw all of the heat from the CPU and the GPU heatsink inside the MacBook and dissipate through the bottom of the chassis. Now, what I'm gonna try to do with this particular AIO is use a combination of those thermal pads, hook it up to this and see if we can actually improve that heat transfer and get it into the AIO, which is gonna be a more effective cooling solution. Now, right now, as you can see there, it does have some thermal paste applied. So first things first is to actually remove that because we're not going to be using that in this video. So I'm gonna quickly use some cleaning solution here to actually get this thermal paste off because we just want this bare copper plate to come in contact with the thermal pads I'm going to put onto the MacBook. Okay, so that's looking nice and shiny and clean. So now I'm just gonna pop these fans onto the radiator itself. And screwing these fans down is a really simple process. You just need four screws that go through the fan and then directly into the radiator behind. One thing you also wanna make sure is don't screw these screws in too hard, otherwise you might crack the radiator. So I'm just trying to do them as gently as possible. Okay, so that's the first fan installed. Let's get the second one in there. Okay, so let's put the radiator off to the side for now. And we're actually going to open up the back chassis of the M1 MacBook Air and just see what we are working with. Okay, so if we take off the back cover of this MacBook Air, you can see this is one of the MacBooks that I've had modded for the last year. So you can see the thermal pad here, and obviously that just gives you a bit of a better contact on the back chassis or the back cover, which is obviously solid aluminum, and it just allows the heat to transfer just a little bit more effectively. So as you can see, we are now swapping this piece of thin aluminum out for this massive, massive CPU cooler. So hopefully this should make for a pretty good little experiment. Okay, at this point, everything is pretty much ready to go. We just need to set up the air cooler itself and make sure that it's actually going to turn on and work. Uh, this is gonna be a pretty difficult little setup because obviously these things are designed to be in a case attached to a full desktop CPU, not on a desk water cooling and M1 MacBook Air. Now with these particular PSUs, they won't actually turn on unless they're connected to the 24 pin header on a motherboard. So to get around that, I've actually bought a cheap little dummy 24 pin connector just from eBay. This is going to directly attach to the 24 pin uh, power cable that comes with this particular PSU. And we're going to now plug this particular PSU into power. And if everything is going to work, which I hope it does, if I flick this power button, we should see some action. So let's get started. Okay, as you can see, we've got some fans on the PSU. Uh, the pump on the header has definitely just started and the fans have just started as well on the radiator itself. Okay, so uh, we are in business, it looks like, which is awesome to see. I really didn't expect this particular uh, janky setup to actually work. Now, typically when attaching this AIO cooler to a CPU, you would use thermal paste. Uh, that's not gonna work in this situation. 
You might be able to see here that the heat sinks of the CPU and the GPU are actually slightly recessed. And that's why the thermal pad mod was so successful. It kind of bridges that gap between the heat sink and the external chassis of the Mac. And likewise, I'm gonna be keeping these on for this particular video because this is gonna help me make contact with the CPU and the GPU and the copper plate of the cooler. Now, how am I gonna make them attach? That's a good question. Uh, I'm going to have to have this particular CPU cooler flat on a desk like so, and then I'm just gonna have to lay this MacBook on top of it like that, and make contact with the thermal pads. So anyway, guys, I'm going to do some benchmarks and do some tests. I'm gonna figure out a way to uh, keep this in one place while I do them. But just before that, guys, a quick word from our sponsor, Private Internet Access. In this digital world, having a reliable VPN is essential and private internet access or PIA is the one I use. With over 30 million downloads, more than 10 years of experience in the VPN industry and 100% open source VPN apps. So what is a VPN? Well, VPN stands for Virtual Private Network and it encrypts all the data sent between your computer and the internet. When using PIA, your IP address will be hidden from websites and your online activity will be hidden from surveillance by your ISP and network admins like hotspot owners. And PIA has one of the strongest, most battle-tested no-logs policies, so you can be super sure your data is protected. You'll also get unrestricted access to all of your favorite content anywhere in the world on any device or operating system, and PIA in particular has a stellar VPN app for macOS. All in all, PIA comes with way more customization and features than virtually every other VPN, and it's one of the few VPNs that fully supports P2P file sharing and torrenting. You can try PIA risk-free with their 30-day money-back guarantee, and if you click on the link below, you can get an extra four months for free. That's 83% off and less than $2 a month for the best VPN on the planet. Okay, so here is how I ended up testing what effects the liquid cooler would have. I kept those thermal pads from the thermal mod attached and simply placed the MacBook Air on top of the AIO block, making solid contact with the gray thermal pad. This pad is directly on top of the M1 chip as this is where all the heat is coming from. And this particular thermal pad also has a very high thermal conductivity rating, so it should transfer heat into the AIO block quite effectively. It's not as conductive as thermal paste, but using thermal paste here isn't really possible or practical. I found the weight of the MacBook kept it firmly attached to the liquid cooler block without having to prop it up or put any weights on top of the MacBook. Now there are some limitations here, for example, the orientation of the liquid cooler block and also the radiator and also the AIO fan and pump speed cannot be controlled. So it's at a default low setting. But as you're about to see, none of this really makes any kind of difference. Also, all the non-liquid cooled tests were conducted with a few centimeters of space underneath the MacBook to keep the testing environment similar to the liquid cooler setup. So did the liquid cooler actually end up working? Well, yes, and it actually ended up working really well. I ran the Endurance CPU benchmark, which utilizes all CPU cores at 100%, and after 10 minutes, I recorded the average temperature of all the CPU cores combined. The liquid-cooled MacBook's CPU was over 40 degrees cooler, or almost twice as cold as the stock and modded MacBooks. When running a Cinebench benchmark, which is one of my favorites as it stresses the CPU and produces a lot of heat, we see similar results when looking at just the performance cores, which run much hotter than the efficiency cores. This massive heat difference can also be observed in the chassis, with the water-cooled MacBook's chassis almost a massive 10 degrees cooler than the stock MacBook. Looking at temperature over time during the Cinebench benchmark, you can see the stock and modded variants of the MacBook Air reaching their thermal limit of around 95 degrees Celsius, while the liquid-cooled MacBook continuously stays at a cool 60 degrees and almost instantly drops to an idle temperature of 25 degrees 
once the benchmark is finished. Okay, so this is interesting and all, and sure, the M1 chip is now running a lot cooler, but how does this translate to real life performance? Looking at the Cinebench scores, actually a fair bit. The liquid cooled MacBook Air keeps the CPU almost twice as cold and outperforms a stock MacBook Air by about 16%. Although the modded variant is a close second and arguably is the better choice because it's a much simpler and cheaper way to squeeze out more performance. Switching to rendering a five minute 6K B-RAW timeline with color correction into 4K H.264 in DaVinci Resolve, we also see a difference, but not as significant as the Cinebench results because we're now using the entire system, not just the CPU. Video rendering on Apple Silicon is actually quite GPU intensive, so we typically see GPU temperatures getting quite hot. As you can see here in this screen recording on a stock M1 MacBook Air while rendering this video. When the liquid cooler is applied, we can observe that the GPU stays cool the entire time and so does the CPU, even though it's typically not at 100% utilization the whole time. Now it's interesting to note here that we're starting to see almost no performance gap between the modded and liquid cooled M1 MacBook Airs. One reason for this is they're both simply very good at absorbing all of that heat from the M1 chip and either dissipating it into the metal case of the MacBook via the thermal pad or into the pump block of the AIO cooler. We can confirm this when running the Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark, which notoriously produces a ton of heat on Apple Silicon MacBooks. Once again, the results were very similar, especially between the modded MacBook and the liquid cooled MacBook, which had almost identical performance. Now I did run some other benchmarks, but they were all about the same. So in the interest of keeping this video relatively compact, I left them out. So what do these results mean? Well, in the grand scheme of things, a five to 10% increase in performance over a stock M1 MacBook Air is not that much at all, especially because to get that extra performance, you have to water cool the MacBook and that is not practical at all. And it's just not something that you would ever do. But what liquid cooling does do is it gives us an insight into how well the M1 MacBook Air regulates its thermals and also how its performance is impacted by the thin chassis and lack of a fan. Now, I think it's fair to say that the M1 MacBook Air does thermal throttle under load, but what's interesting is how little it throttles. While under full load, particularly CPU intensive tasks, you're only losing out on maybe five to 10% of the maximum available performance of the M1 chip. Now, the keen eyed among you may be wondering why the M1 chip performance didn't increase even though it had a ton of thermal headroom left while being liquid cooled. Well, this is because the M1 chip is limited by how much power or wattage it can consume in total. Even if I were to use liquid nitrogen to get the M1 chip temperature down to something ridiculous like two degrees Celsius, performance wouldn't increase because the chip can only use a certain amount of power, which is up to 40 watts. And this just shows how balanced the design of the M1 MacBook Air really is. Totally silent, very slim chassis, yet decent performance and very little thermal throttling, even when under full load and close to maximum wattage. Sure, Apple could have included a fan or a slightly beefier heatsink to squeeze out that extra five to 10 performance under full load, but this kind of defeats the purpose of a laptop with the word air in its name. The biggest takeaway for me from this little experiment is how interesting it will be to see how Apple develops super powerful ARM-based desktop systems in the future. They won't have to worry about cramming everything into a tiny laptop chassis and the reduced heat dissipation and restricted wattage that comes with it. Which means they're probably going to be able to unlock the full potential of their Apple Silicon chips. But apart from that guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you in the next one.